Ready? Ready? Mr. Manager? Yes, sir. All right, we'll call the uh, September 11, 2018 meeting of the Macon County Board of Commissioners uh, to order. I'd like to welcome all of you in attendance to see a few familiar faces and uh, a few new ones. So, again, I'd like to welcome all of you as we partake uh, the business of Macon County this evening. Uh, with that being stated, we'll go ahead and roll under our agenda uh, with announcements. Any announcements? Mr. Chairman, I would like to announce that the Macon County Fair begins Wednesday through Saturday and uh, we're hoping for good weather uh, but we, we expect large crowds as usual and if you've not ever attended the Bacon County Fair it is the last true agriculture fair left in North Carolina and we're very proud of that so on behalf of fellow director Commissioner Gillespie we invite you to the Bacon County Fair. Good thank you. Any other announcements? Well, if we'll all rise, we'll observe a, uh, a moment of silence. And I'd like to mention uh, uh, two things as we observe our moment of silence. Um, uh, number one, uh, uh, the funeral for uh, Herb James uh, was today in Highlands. Uh, for those of you that don't know Herb, Herb was the uh, town manager for the town of Highlands for 32 years. And I believe after that, he was a Highlands Town Commissioner uh, for 16 years. So, uh, please keep his uh, family in your prayers. And second, uh, uh, it's obvious uh, what today is. Uh, 17 years ago, our country was uh, changed forever. Uh, this tragedy will always be remembered in our hearts. And uh, so we observe the special day and all that it represents. Uh, we honor the value of life, our country's resilience, uh, and the great American spirit. So with that, let's observe a moment of silence. I'll ask Commissioner Bell to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of our country. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. We do not have any public, uh, public hearing this evening. Uh, uh, next up is our public comment period. First up is uh, Mr. Powell Jacobs. Uh, Mr. Jacobs, welcome again. Thank you so much. Get my cheat sheet out here. First of all, I'd like to thank you for letting me speak, and uh, I'd like to thank all that came to Nanahalo a while back and uh, do a little meeting over at a little double wide trailer. <laughs> but uh, thank you for that. And uh, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of uh, questions asked, and we we got a lot of answers and. Uh, uh, I really learned a lot at that meeting, and uh, uh, Mr. Gillespie here, I talked to him for a pretty good while, and he, he really informed me on quite a bit of stuff, and uh, Monty Bill there, and uh, uh, like I say, we learned a lot, and uh, we also learned that uh, Mr. Bill's got a big appetite like me. Really? How would you ever guess that? <laughs> That's pretty good, but anyway, we... Uh, uh, well, I learned a lot about the fire department, about the money situation there, and the uh, recycle center, and how things work, and uh, how slow things can be through the government. And uh, I learned that, and uh, I want to apologize tonight for the past. Uh, I came over here uh, spouting my mouth off about a lot of stuff, and I really didn't know how things worked, and I want just to accept my apology for that. Uh, saying that, uh, we, we, I'm still uh, want to remind us about our, we need a community building over there really bad. And uh, our uh, recycle center, it still needs, it really still needs some upgrading over there. I think Ron just said that Jim's going to start and look at it. Jim's, it Indeed. You can see what I'm talking about, right? So, we did. And I know that uh, that might take a while, but we, we still. We want to see that. And uh, uh, 
you you guys are a whole lot smarter than me and know how to get things done and you can get things done and uh, I would just like to uh, remind us that please uh, really help us out over there for some things that we need and uh, like again I, I do thank y'all for coming over the other day and like I say I learned a lot uh, thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jacobs, I uh, just want to say that's mighty uh, spride and heads up of you. We appreciate that. And uh, uh, I can assure you that uh, each of us have heard you all loud and clear. Uh, it's on our minds, and uh, we've been doing a good bit of research on it. And, uh, again, you mentioned something that's uh, uh, probably my biggest frustration when I first became a commissioner, and that was how slow th some things in government work. But I think there's a reason for that that our forefathers uh, saw before us uh, to make sure we make wise and correct decisions. But uh, we hear you and we are working on it. That's my problem. I don't always make wise and correct decisions. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> I don't either. Thank you. Uh, Barbara McCray, Women's History Trail. Welcome, Barbara. Thank you. <laughs> oh, good evening, and uh, thank you all for having me tonight. Um, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate everything you do for the county. I learned from being on the town council uh, some of what's involved in uh, this type of government work, and I know you work really, really hard on our behalf, and I appreciate it. Uh, tonight I'm here to represent the uh, Women's History Trail. Um, this is just a little information piece. I just read off about six copies, but uh, it just shows you um, something about public sculpture in the United States and um, how little represented women have been historically and even at present there are more figures like Gumby and inanimate objects and animals uh, as pu put up as public sculptures than of women um, but that is it's just for your information I just thought that was kind of interesting it was from the National Geographic uh, the Women's History Trail is a project of the Folk Heritage Association of Macon County, and I know you're familiar with that organization and, and all the good that they do and how hard they work and how many fine people are really dedicated in that organization to getting things done. Um, they, uh, we're lucky that they're sponsoring us. Our purpose is to build a trail starting in downtown Franklin, but eventually it could reach all parts of Macon County because the purpose of the trail is to celebrate the lives of the women of Macon County and um, what they contributed to creating the society that we have today. Um, we'll, we're going to open the first phase of the trail on October 27th, and you all are invited to attend if you, if you can. we we'll start with eight sites that have association with certain women or groups of women or a single woman. Some of those were associated with the county, such as the, the social workers who were crammed in little offices on the Corbin building for quite a long time, five of them running the whole social service department in, in Macon County. Um, an important part of the trail will be public art. And uh, we probably should have started with something small that we could get done quickly and cheaply. But we fell in love with the story of three women of the pioneer era. One was Cherokee, one was African American, and one white, whose lives were intersected, whose lives were all associated in, to some degree with the Indian now, and the Kwasi now. And um, they were just very strong women. Uh, the Cherokee woman actually sued the U.S. government after she was uh, forced off her reservation. Her, her home was burned down by General Thomas Love's son, and they had to leave, and then they lost their land, and she sued the government. Um, so I mean, that's the kind of feisty person that we're talking about here. Uh, she won the case, actually. And uh, the African woman uh, was a slave of hers who was sold to Jesse Seiler. Uh, and the third woman in the, in the threesome is uh, Tom Maxina Seiler, who was the daughter of Jesse. So um, I can tell you the whole story someday when you have time. I know you don't have time tonight to hear all this. It's really a fascinating story, and it really mesmerizes everyone who, who hears it. And uh, we see it really as representing three matriarchal figures in Macon County's history and a way of bringing public attention to the work that these women did. 
throughout history and their goodness, their wisdom, and the efforts that they made to survive the often tragic circumstances of their lives. Uh, the piece will be located near the river and uh, near the Indian Man. And you know there's a lot of renewal going on there thanks to Main Spring. The Cherokees have purchased a building near the Man. Um, the land is being reclaimed from uh, brown fields. And this sculpture will go, go there facing the mound. And someday, I, I'm dreaming <laughs> that there will be a beautiful plaza there and that will really transform the face of Franklin and really bring a, a powerful message to everyone who comes to Macon County. I think it will really be great for tourism, for our children, for many, 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 many things. Um, Already in this overall project, we have the town, the county, the Cherokee, Main Spring, Mountain Partners, and Quasi Initiatives, and Women's History Trail now. We're all working in the same big project. The Women's History Trail has engaged uh, Wesley Wofford, and I don't know, Mr. Tate, if you know him, he's a sculptor living in um, Cashers. Fantastic uh, sculptor, That's and he was able to mm -hmm. help us with this project. He's finished the design my cat. We had it. Uh, a meeting recently, and I was standing there watching everyone who came in the room one by one. They were just a small room, and people would go in and look at it. And everyone, every single one of them said, Oh, wow! And they just were just blown away by the power of this piece that he's designed. <coughs> um, the final piece will be full size figures, which means seven feet tall because if you have a smaller human-sized person, it looks like a little teeny person when you have it, <laughs> when it's a public sculpture. And I had to go and look at a few to convince to myself of that, but it really is true. And if, you, if you're looking around at, at pieces, sometimes you'll see a piece that's like maybe this big, and it would actually look pretty good if you were in a room with it maybe, but it's standing outside, it's, it's like a midget. It's a strange, strange thing. Um, this is going to co it's going to be a long term project, like two to two and a half years, just because of the technical processes involved. And it's going to cost a lot of money, and we realize that. So right now we're trying to raise money. And what I'm asking you all to do uh, is to authorize uh, County Manager Derek Rowland to write a letter of support for us. We are applying for a Z Smith Reynolds grant that has just been announced. It's a new grant that they are offering for inclusive public sculpture. And it sounds like it was written just for us because they want to um, support public art that uh, represents underrepresented factions of the population, such as minorities and women who don't appear often in public art. And um, it has to tell a local story I mean, we hit all the key points of, of, of this grant. So, if you—that's all we're asking you tonight—is if you would allow that. It's a fifty thousand dollar grant. It would really be a tremendous help to us if we could get that. I think we'd have a good chance. Um, I is certain, but uh, we're going to go. Sounds through. good. Can we get a motion to that effect? Second motion. 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 Commissioner Higgins, a second by Commissioner Bill. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Oh, thank you very, very much. I really appreciate yeah, absolutely. it. Absolutely. Appreciate you. all your work. Now, where does the trail start, Barbara? You didn't. Well, it's going to, the, what we have now will just be in town. We're starting with eight sites in town from the town hall <coughs> to the Franklin Terrace. Okay. And then, but eventually, like, it'll go ahead and expand down. To the river and then to Race Chapel, which we're hoping that the town can acquire very soon. And eventually, who knows? Maybe all the way to Highlands? Who knows? Yeah. Ms. McCray, are you involved in the September 22nd? Yes, I am. Can you elaborate on that just a minute? That's probably where I saw your name. I oh, kept trying. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, all these things are all intertwined. T September 22nd, um, Mountain Partners and the Quasi Initiative is launching, is, is dedicating the very first kiosk yes. that we are creating. I say we because I'm on that board um, the kiosk, the large, beautiful uh, information kiosk. One will go at Nefasi now. One is going at Kawi, across the river from the mound and the town site. And it tells the story so people can see and understand what they're looking at and how it might have looked back, you know, 200 years, 1,000 years ago. But it will be on display at the Kawi School on 
September 22nd. Uh -huh, that's a Saturday. September Saturday. 22nd. 930. You all should be, you should have gotten an invitation in your mailbox or, or you will soon. Uh, 930, they're having a breakfast for the invitees, so please come and um, I think you'll be very, very impressed. They've, they've gotten some tremendous graphic artists to do this. Um, Several elders have signed up to be there, and the chief will be there. The chief will be there, yes. There's going to be a significant uh, delegation from Cherokee. And the last time that they were over here, we had a little event at the Nikwasi Mount. It was just wonderful. I mean, it was so much fun to interact and to get to know them a little better. And they were, you know, it's, it's just been a very positive experience to have the two cultures sort of picking this on together. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. That's All right. And our next uh, individual, I'm going to have to excuse me, but I can't read it. It's Fixing Potholes on Silver Spruce Lane. Yes. Can you, sure. can you uh, pronounce uh, your name for me? It's Brigitta. Brigitta. Uh, it's B-I-R-G-I-T-T-A. -T -T <laughs> Last name is K-A-A-D-O. Very good. And I'm here on behalf Welcome. of, uh, thank you so mm -hmm. much. Good evening, everybody. And uh, I'm here on behalf of, we have over 20 residents on Silver Spruce Lane, and uh, we're all Macon County taxpayers. Silver, I'm sorry. The Silver name. Spruce Lane. It's uh, right up uh, where White Horizon goes, and then Silver. Is it a state maintained one? I don't know. Nobody maintaining right now. Yeah. Nobody's, uh, nobody's no maintaining. There's no maintenance. maintaining. It's, it's not a state. The, what the county does not do roads. The county doesn't do roads? No. Okay, who would? You'd contact the DOT. We could certainly give you that information if it's a state maintained road. If it's not, it's a private. Mm -hmm. Warren, do you know offhand here? No, it's just not on the state list. And I'm aware of it. it would be a private road. It's the Luke Road right there in the curve at the top of the hill there at the fairgrounds right across from where you're trying to go over Billy Van. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, so the fairgrounds are here. Yeah. And then Wide Horizon goes like this, and then Silver Spruce then goes up. So it's a private road. Yeah. So. Do you have a homeowners association? With no. Restricted covenants for the subdivisions that might impose some road maintenance obligations. Check your deed. Okay. So it would be on the deed? Typically, or a reference to restricted okay. covenants that might be found in a separate document. Okay. How many homes is that? Is that many? There's over 20. So there's a fairly good chance that somewhere there's some restricted covenants and possibly a road maintenance okay. somewhere. Fairly good chance of that. There's 20 homes. Yeah. So I'll look into that. And who's the road maintenance agreement with? It would be among homeowners and homeowners. possibly the developer if the developer still. Is it a paved road or gravel road? It's a paved road going up and then on the other side it's gravel coming down. And you know, the loop. Yeah, it loops kind of on. And our concern you're... that the, the potholes are so bad that even you know, if emergency vehicles like ambulance has to come up and you know, in a serious situation, the the way the potholes are, it's becoming, I think, a public health concern. So, so I have to look into that. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, and I know I didn't put it on this list, but. Um, is there a leash law in Macon County? For dogs? For dogs? No. <laughs> Greenway or anything? Yes. Yeah. In, inside the city? In the side of the city. But what if, yeah, I have to check. But what if we're not in the city? No, there, there is no. There's no leash law? <clears throat> Nothing. Cause we have like three dogs that are running loose. And they you contacted animal control? Animal control? Because it's a nuisance, and I'm afraid we the Macon County Health part. Department. It's <laughs> the so Macon County Health yeah. Department. Mr. Brettner can give you that first number. That, that gentleman there in the blue coat. We'll give you the number. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I'm learning so much. Thank you. Um, all right. So, and then how about nuisance? Is there any? There like is a after? nuisance law. Yeah, because there's like two dogs and they just bark starting like at nine o'clock all into the morning. I have recordings. It's like my parents 
just hardly able to sleep, and I'm starting to lose sleep. The nuisance law probably don't cover but yeah, the dogs in the pen. Don't cover dogs. Don't cover dogs. Yeah, I'm sorry. Don't cover but I mean, it's dog. loud, so like it's a nuisance. So you have to distinguish it. I think it. is the loud music. I think it, I think yeah. the nuisance ordinance may expressly exclude it does. dogs. It does. It does. It does. Uh, I mean, I love The dogs. state of North Carolina, I mean, part of that is the state law on the hunting dogs, you know, about keeping them up and keeping them under a pen if, they're, if the dogs are keeping them in a safe place mm -hmm. and being taken care of. There's no, I don't think we could even pass that law if we wanted to. Yeah. Wow. All right. Um, well, thank you so much for all the information. <clears throat> Well, what about Good luck your on your road. Holes? What about your potholes? Your potholes that what did? So I'm gonna I'm gonna review the uh, restrictive deed covenants to see yep. if there's any type of uh, road maintenance agreement. So I guess that's my first step. You might when you closed on your transaction, if you mm -hmm. had uh, title insurance issue, it should give you a reference to okay. all of those restrictive covenants and might give you a jump start to find what you need to look at. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure we've had to I'm sure there is, especially if there's, if there's a mortgage, so. If you don't buy a mortgage, there would be. Exactly, yes. So. Did you just buy the property recently? Or? Um, no, about 10, 10 years. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. And we love living here. It's okay. great, Thank great you. to have. See if we could do more. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next on the list, I have Bill and Kay Thomas. I think you're already on our agenda, though. Yeah. Did you have something else you wanted to address the board about, or just your floodplain ordinance? I guess I can. No, you're on the agenda. Okay. I didn't know if there was another topic you wanted to address. Okay. Not a problem. Anyone else like to address the board? One else. All right, let's move on. <clears throat> uh, additions to the agenda or changes. Mr. Mm -hmm. we could 9B, we could do just a quick update on the uh, airport contract. Okay. We'll add that as item 9B. Anything else, Mr. Manager? No, sir. Quiet night. Mr. Chairman, they, I would request a short closed section with we anticipate no action being taken. I've informed the county attorney concerning uh, discussion of property. Can it be possible acquisition of property? No. Just discussion of some property. Where does that go there? Where does that There'll be no acquisition. Oh, just all the way down. No acquisition. We need to speak with you before going into closed session to make sure that we can go into closed session for that purpose. The real well, it would be acquisition, wouldn't it, Mr. Manning? Yes, and there it would be acquisition. Okay. Yeah. We'll say it's limited to acquisition. So. We call it acquisition. Yeah. All right. Um, anything else? If not, we'll uh, take a motion to approve the agenda. So move. Second. Motion to second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Reports and presentations. Uh, a. Nanahela Community Library. Mr. Ed Trask. Welcome, Ed. Good evening. Appreciate your time. Sure. Appreciate your efforts. Um, first of all, I want to thank Hal for uh, his efforts in, in bringing Manhattan to the forefront. Uh, yeah. Got a few handouts for you. I believe the 
first page is the summary of actions uh, back in February uh, we had a community meeting over in Nana Hale uh, Mr. Hayden was kind enough to come over and meet with us um, we uh, formed a committee to look at possible sites for a uh, new building uh, and it says um, possibility of sharing a building with the library their recommendation was to build a building on the Duke property uh, we call it the rec center uh, it's owned by Duke uh, and there's a 99 year lease uh, with uh, I believe 30 some odd years remain uh, then in March the library board and staff met to review strategies to gather input further input from all of the people in Manhattan regarding uh, what their wants and needs were uh, regarding a new building for library slash community facility and the purpose of the input from these various surveys from these various groups and people uh, was to acknowledge the recent activity um, initiated by Al and others in the community club for a new facility uh, providing the participants with information regarding uh, library services that are currently available including services available through the Fontana Regional Library and the long-range plan focus of the, um, we wanted to gather information from a broad segment of the community to get their input uh, re regarding services that uh, the library and uh, community club could have available um, as we know services shape the space um, with input from the community we could better garner what uh, future plans would be for various services and so on um, we wanted to gather information from a broad segment of the community about also the most convenient location for library building and establish uh, the level of interest in partnering, partnering with the community club. Uh, Mr. Hagen requested a building for Nanahala Community Club <coughs> Library be included as a high priority in the county's capital facilities plan. And we thank you, Mr. Hagen, for that. Um, the library board supported the strategies, strategies suggested for gathering input, including focus groups, uh, community input sessions, surveys, and interviews with stakeholders. Um, in May, also, the focus group was held with the teachers and school personnel at the Manhattan School. Um, we also held a focus group with the community club members to get, gain input from them. And uh, in July, a uh, community input session was held at Manhattan Library. Uh, phone interviews were held with Chris Baldwin, um, Macon County Superintendent, and Melissa Evans, school board member representing Manhattan. Um, I also spoke with Melissa face-to-face uh, -to, -face to get her input. Uh, in August, the focus group was held with the volunteer firefighters, again, to try to include every segment of Manhattan that we can think of and get as much information as we could. Uh, August into September, we've also had a survey conducted online and it is still online uh, as well as paper copies uh, as well as we've had surveys at the library 
and the community club in the library. The community club meeting to share findings on the focus groups, uh, the input sessions and the surveys. The library is seeking the club support uh, and we had a meeting last night with the uh, community club and um, there's a couple of representatives out of them. Uh, Tom Oswald is the president of the community club um, and we have support, a, a unified effort to uh, approach the commissioners regarding the in, in, input, uh, the information that we have gathered um, and reporting on the process and findings of the Sacramento County Commissioner meeting. Um, we would uh, request that the County Commission include a new community library facility uh, with the, uh, as the other libraries in the um, organization uh, contain a community room, community space for uh, community clubs as well as uh, a multitude of other uh, uses and needs. Uh, as you can see by the tax information, um, and we did not, we did not go to the focus groups with suggestions or options. All of these, all of the input that you see here, uh, is strictly independently uh, offered by the people in that gym and the various focus groups. As you can see, the the three most important things when you use the library, um, classes and events for adults, uh, exercise, arts and music, and, and nature, uh, and that includes the summer programs for the youth uh, in the community. Um, Wi-Fi, high-speed internet uh, was the second most popular, and checking out books, natural library. Um, and if you flip over to the next page, three other library or community services you'd like to see offered close to you. Uh, a bigger, nicer place for family reunions and birthday parties. Uh, those of you familiar with Nanahalo know that we are very limited as far as spaces to hold such functions, and we have some family reunions that are quite extensive. Um, community involvement activities such as job fairs and so on, something for everybody. Uh, and more bandwidth, uh, more reliable high-speed internet. Uh, that was another important item. Um, and choose one place where we, you would like to see the library located. And again, we did not offer any options or suggestions. This is strictly input from the people. Um, the, the most popular was around the White Oak area. That's a central location in Anaheim. Um, uh, there are positives and negatives to all of these. Um, the second most popular was the existing location uh, right next to the school. Uh, and the third most popular was around Woya Road. Uh, Woya Road just runs the whole length of that head. Um, and you can see uh, down the bottom of that page various comments that people gave along with their suggestions uh, regarding locations. So what we are looking at and asking the town commissioners to do is to include uh, the library slash community room facility in a space need study, uh, a capital facilities plan, whatever you want to refer to it as. Uh, and that's basically Bottom line. Any questions? 
Did you discuss any sizes yet? No, the size of space. We, we wanted to gain the information from the community as to what their wants and needs were first. Uh, and Building then, the program. Mm -hmm. Right. And then go from there. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any questions? Well, Karen and I went down the White Oak Flats Road and uh, thought we had something cooking at one time, but the problem with that is not only the water and the sewer, that's number one, but the property. And the, pl the place that we chose had a little water problem to start with, not good water, but bad water. Mm -hmm. And so finding a location is really tough in Mount Haley, as you know. We, and we worked on it pretty hard. So I really think that you know, how the community feels and, and right there at the existing location, we've looked at it pretty close. Mm -hmm. And there are ways to make it secure. And we've had that discussion too. And we've had it with Superintendent Baldwin and the county manager. I'm sure Paul's looked at it. And uh, there are ways you could do that. Right. And, uh, and there are some room there. You might have to be a little unique building. It'd have to be you know, long and, and maybe not as wide. Mm -hmm. But there are some room above where that building is now. That line extends on up. Pretty good piece. So that's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, might be some retaining wall work, but that'd still be cheaper. And I think me and Karen, even when we looked at it, uh, you know, the problem, you know, there is a security risk, but with some new, the new locks that they're putting on and some things that I, I'm, you know, just a lot of us talking. That, that that would be just it just makes sense mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons so and i hope it is included and i think it of course it's up to the board but you know, we when i was liaison to the to the library we uh, we looked at it a lot mm -hmm. and it's and it's a needy thing there's no doubt about that absolutely absolutely is this a combination you've got a library and a community center in one building uh, yes, sir. All of the libraries in the Montana system have a community room uh, available for the community or whatever. Uh, all these these uh, suggestions that people have said that they would like. Do you have the space there, Mr. Bill? There where the trailers are at the back of the school? Yeah, you'd have a good burnout, number one, and clean it up and, and uh, fix it. You could fix that property. Mm -hmm. There's some there's some property to be fixed right there. It would take some, you know, they'd take, I think you have to put a retainer wall around it and fix it. That's what Karen and I looked at a long time ago. Uh -huh. We had a lady, I forget her name, at the White Oak that, that was going to help us. And that sort of fell through. And and uh, <clears throat> but then the other property we looked at, we can't if if the county gets involved, we can't. As Paul can tell you, there's some special provision for water and sewer. Right. And and to babysit that from a long, long time. So we're planning on enhancing that sewer system at Nine Halo School sooner or later. Anyway, it's going to have to be. Mm -hmm. And so we have that in place. Got good water there, and it's being tested. It's so that's already being taken care of. So a lot of that just makes uh, economic wise and and what it says in here. I think I read uh, the accessibility to the folks and and uh, it's well lit accessible and I think if we can get over the hump of the, of the school security and I think we can work that out and me and Mr. Shields have, have talked about that with Dr. Baldwin and, and with Paul and, and if Paul uh, we all get our heads together I think it can be worked out the key thing I didn't call any meetings or deserve any credit. You know, I was approached by a member of the community to come over and talk to them about it, just to look at it. Because I heard Karen for years talking about leaking roofs. <laughs> and it's a shame it's gone this far. But we let the roofs leak for 10 or 12 years before we address it. But anyway, the thing that and I stressed over there is, is if the Nanahala community comes together, there's two items community at exit, community building, and the library two critical needs in my in, in that have a community both well deserved and long past due i think it's more appropriate if the community and i'm glad i heard you say that you had met with the community club i know i've spent a lot of time with hal and randy they're the ones that got me interested in got us got it rolling and 
as long as a community, you know, I don't think we ought to say, hey, you guys, this is what Nana Haley needs. You know, we're over there, what, once a month or once every two months or election time, maybe every week. But uh, I'm glad to hear that, I'm, and I'm hoping that there's some congenial uh, understanding that y'all want to work as a community and not library versus community exactly. or community club. Put it together and I think the appropriate way for me individually, I'm not speaking to the full board, is once you all bring it to us and we've got a plan on record that was presented at one time and discussed in meetings. So, you know, once you get it worked out, it's obviously those two things need to be addressed. It needs to be high priority. As I stated, when want to come over there and Hal's stressing that government will move slow. <laughs> but at least we're talking about it and we're trying to get a plan together and funding hopefully is going to be one of the top items when we approve this capital improvement plan around January. So thank you for your effort. Thank you, Karen, Hal, and Randy Shook, and all the community members. Uh, we've, we've all identified the need. Let's get together and make it happen. And uh, all of these issues, sewer, water, uh, the, the broadband stuff is tough. We've got to have that. So all of these issues, we can work them out. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly I appreciate your time as a member of the library board and uh, uh, certainly appreciate how Randy and Karen, everybody's working on this thing. Thank you all a bunch. Speak I'm also, loud. I'm also a, a resident of Nanahama and uh, involved with the community club as well. We have the president here of the community club. So at our meeting last night, I think we, we uh, think of one accord. Just about anything you get is going to be better than what you got. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Trust. Thank you very much. Appreciate, Appreciate your time coming over the hill. All right, item 9B, airport contract. Commissioner Gillespie. Just a quick update. Uh, airport Authority negotiated. Let uh, me back up. There's been a FBO uh, contract in place, I believe I'm correct, in the past 20 years. Yes, sir. Um, that is due to expire the last day of September. The airport Authority has negotiated a new contract with a new provider. Uh, that contract has been signed and they will be taken over October 1st. Uh, airport Authority feels very strongly that this new contract is going to be much better for the citizens of Macon County to be able to provide some additional services at the airport. Uh, and, and we're, we're hoping that uh, that will come to fruition, but it, it does look, look very good. We're very good. Good. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, All right. Moving right along. Uh, old business uh, uh, item A: class action matter regarding PILT or payment in lieu of taxes. Uh, Mr. Turner. Gentlemen, as you know, um, there are a number of counties throughout the United States that contain a large amount of federal land. We happen to be one of those counties. So the counties that are in that situation are not able to tax the federal government on those lands for ad valorem tax purposes. Uh, however, the federal government recognized that that caused problems to some counties and so they enacted some legislation called PILT or payment in lieu of taxes. Basically what it does is it pays some money from the federal government to the uh, counties that have these uh, federal lands to try to help those counties along a little bit. This class action lawsuit was uh, filed um, it's titled, entitled Kane County, Utah versus the United States. Basically what's been determined is, is that for the years 2015, 16, and 17, uh, the PILT uh, payments uh, were not fully made by the federal government and there's a class action lawsuit to see to it that those payments are fully made. Macon County was identified as one of the counties which had not received full payment of PILT monies. It appears that there was roughly 13,600 and change dollars that was, should have been paid to the county that wasn't paid. The law firm of Smith Curry uh, is pursuing that class action and is pursuing the payment of those taxes. 
they have asked whether or not Macon County wants to opt in in order to recover that money. They basically are charging a one-third contingency fee for their work. If you don't opt in, you're not going to receive payment unless you hire somebody to pursue it. And in all likelihood, it's going to cost more than that one-third that they are seeking. So if the county is inclined to pursue uh, the recovery of those PILT payments that they should have received in any event, uh, it would be my advice that you consider opting into this class action. Will it cost us anything if we don't want to sue so, yeah. What is your recommendation? My recommendation is it's an additional sum of revenue. It's not a tremendous sum of revenue, but it is an additional sum of revenue and basically it will be very easy to opt in if you're inclined to do so. You would just need to authorize me to, uh, to let them know that you desire to opt in. Do you have to pay the one-third up front? No. Okay. There'll be no recovery unless, there'll be no payment unless they recover. And this is a long way down the road. Uh, apparently, because Utah, we, we talked about in Hickory, had a big long meeting in Hickory. This is not going to happen. These, these are going after millions of dollars. It's billions of dollars. It's millions and millions of dollars. There are some counties that are going to receive as much as $130,000. But this year we were fully funded, and uh, it did. You know, we, we worked very hard on PIL. A lot of us around this table has for a long time, and and uh, the only thing I think we need to be careful of: if you opt in uh, and your name's on this lawsuit, uh, we don't know where it's going to end. That was a conversation that was had in Hickory. A lot of the counties, you know, there's about nine or there's about 14 counties. North Carolina, Swain County being the biggest by far. Uh, I don't know what their stance is. Nobody was there from Swain County. Uh, I would, uh, I would suggest, Mr. Chairman, that we, there's no big rush here. Actually, there is. If you're going to opt in, you've got to opt in by Friday. Ooh. We told you that. The lawyers. No, the paperwork from the federal court. But the lawyers. No, the federal court judge. With the lawyers that's, that bring the suit to the court. Now, this was an order issued by the federal court that set that deadline. Well, there, there, there may be a strategy of not to opt in. Make it, make it so quick that you can't get your ducks in a row. Now, this is this has been pending and out there since uh, probably about June or July. So it's not. It's not the yeah, It's not new. The thing about the pill payments is that if we did not have federal land in Macon County, we'd be in that wide spot in the road somewhere. And I understand the value. I think Lauren and I just got $300,000, $350,000 a year is our pill payment. <coughs> That's taking tax dollars out of your left hand pocket and putting them into your right hand pocket. It's federal tax dollars. So. $350,000. What is the value of 50% of public land in Macon County? What kind of attraction, what kind of tourist attraction, economic benefits from it? Yeah, it would be nice to have it $307,000 in our budget, but in the long run, without that public land in Macon County, we'd be a whole different, we'd be a whole different county. So I don't think it's a great big issue if we, if we lose the pill payment, in my personal opinion, We've lost that cat, that three hundred fifty thousand dollars of tax dollars that we would get, but it's still tax money. It's somebody, somebody's paying it. So it's not like we're in Potter's County with twenty something million sitting in a uh, fund balance. So to me, I'm, I'm saying let it, let it go. And if they stop the pill, all the better. But now, does the schools receive the pill money? They receive the SRS money. SRS. Okay. You don't mind talking a little bit more about what you're concerned about. Well, the other counties in the West, you know, Swain County leads you by far. They're, <clears throat> they're about 86% federal. Right. And they take a whole different view than what Paul just said, I'll guarantee you. Yeah. And we're 51%. So if that was in the private sector, and Richard like to that. tax it, but on the PIP part, uh, a lot of these counties have decided that since we are fully funded, we 
we are fully funded this time, right, Lori? Yeah, you got fully funded for the first time, and, and that was coming out of the recession. And if you go back, we were fully funded. We've even got more money than that at one time. And so I think a lot of the counties that we talked to, uh, they were not opting into the lawsuit simply because they didn't want their county listed under that suit, being part of that suit, because they think it could come back and bite you later on down the road. I don't know that. I don't because Peel it's it's the West that drives Peel. It's the it's the big big state the Utahs and that's who drives Peel. I mean you look at us and we're just a little glimmer, but you go to those western states and they're like Utah, the whole state. And there's very few counties in North Carolina that even has that. So that was one of the concerns. The second concern is uh, especially these counties that have a lot and we're and we're right up there with them. Uh, is this the right number? We don't know. Is, there, is it 13,000? Is it a whole lot more than that, a lot less than that? There's no really way to tell. You go by. I think they've actually uh, adjudicated these numbers at this time. Uh, there have been some, some uh, agreements made by uh, the respective parties after accountings and whatnot. These apparently are. Much numbers. It looks like a positive case. It really does. In front of the court. Yeah, I, I don't think there's any question there's going to be a verdict in favor of the candidates. Yeah. But now, if they get paid off that, and when they get paid, is a different question. You can get a positive. It can you can come back as a positive, but getting the check that's the people in Swain County. Uh, so I don't have no one way or the other, just some discussions we've had. I don't have no quorums one way or the other. If it gives us, if we get 13 grand out of it. It'll be 13 grand less a third, and there's probably going to be about a 1% expense. So we'd end up with? 8,000. Yeah. It's not going to be a tremendous sum of money, but... Uh, there's, you know, always that one way of looking at every little bit helps. So. Oh, yeah. is, is the purpose greater than the money? Is the purpose greater than the money? I'm not sure I understand what you mean. I'm not sure purpose. I understand what I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> well, <interesting> discussion. <laughs> Some, sometimes the going ahead with something has a greater purpose than the the money of it uh, in this situation the money of it or it could work the other way too yeah well, yeah i, I, I would be i point. guess more concerned about the point that ronnie articulated except for the fact that i understand the federal government has basically stipulated to these numbers in other words they have uh, essentially indicated yeah there are underpayments and if they were taking a position, no, there haven't been underpayments. Okay. I'd be a little more worried about uh, those things, I guess. All right. So everybody's agreed on their map. Everybody agrees that the payments were not made. They're still sued. So, well, the, the, the series is brought to this point. point. Where do you the money? There's no question. I, I, We're doing more money than that. Probably. And I, and I think the federal government has basically agreed to reduce it. Yeah. So I don't have no quorum to determine what it is. I don't see any problem with it at all. I don't, I don't either. Personally, I, I think it <laughs> kind of puts a briar in the in it and says that hey, we're this is these monies are important to us. And it's important that you pay it. I don't have a problem with it. That was my argument down there. You know, for rural counties, <coughs> three hundred seven thousand dollars a year don't mean a whole lot to some of these, you know, these out in Utah and Nebraska and some of them places. But three hundred seven thousand dollars to us and the SRS money has been completely cut off. So uh, now go back to that statement you just said: the SRS money is school completely. resource. No, but is it completely cut out? Yeah. yeah. When did that happen? Hey, we got it for two years. No, we got it last year and we yes. actually got a second payment which made us yeah. whole in 
Shorts. In shorts. Yeah. <laughs> but it's something that's from that the logging in. Surprised me right. that we got that second payment for last fiscal year. Yeah. Chester, you don't feel like joining this would jeopardize any payments that we're covering. So. I, I don't think so. I, I would be concerned again if the federal government was saying, no, wait a minute, we don't owe you this. But if they sat down and stipulated that these sums were owed, um, would be very surprised if they came back and said, now we're going to hold this against you, even though we stipulated that, that it's owed. All right. But if we're holding this, let's try to collect it. It's due or it's our money. A motion or a consensus or what do you? I think what we would need is a motion to opt in, and if you desire to opt in, uh, to authorize me or Derek or uh, the chairman to uh, go online and and do the necessary. Well, I'll make a motion that we opt in to collect our bill payment due to the county and give the uh, county attorney and the county manager authorization to pursue it and second. with no expense to our town got a motion and a second, second. Any further discussion all in favor aye, aye. opposed aye four to one thank you chester thank you all right um moving on to uh new business uh discussion regarding fire study recommendations <laughs> emergency services director mr warren cave welcome warren thank you mr chairman <coughs> I actually have a uh, fairly easy discussion tonight. I don't need any money. And I don't want any kind of decision. All I got is you should touch my car. Um, a little background on, on what I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, and you all are well aware of this, but sometimes the public is not necessarily aware of this. Out of the, the 11 fire departments that we have, uh, two of those are municipalities, of course, but nine of those are nonprofit organizations. Uh, and as such, you know, those organizations are all contracted to Macon County to provide a service, just as we would building contractor, grading contractor, et cetera. However, the service they provide is essentially fire protection. And one of the things that, that we recognized in the fire study we did in 2017 was there was a section of their contract that's been in place for several years that we needed some clarification on. And I'll read you the, the quote out of the contract, and I think you've got copies of this in your agenda packet. Uh, it's under section B of their contract. It says, quote, any expenditure that establishes a new operating expense that will extend beyond the current fiscal year shall require the concurrence of the Mason County Fire Marshal's Office, end quote. Um, essentially, and I understand the intent of, of how this is written out of the contract, um, Occasionally, either our office or Derek's office or the county in general will get some some request from a financial institution when the department's buying a truck or something, and they want to know, you know, are they in good standing? What kind of money do you think they're going to get this year? Well, what can you tell us? Are, are they have they been inspected? Um, Basically, what we would like to see, and for something for you to think about, and this is something we can come back you know, a couple months down the road after you think about some options, is we would like to know what would you like that quote concurrence to apply to, and also how would you like for us to define concurrence? Uh, what, what what do you want to see from these folks? Um, and there's a lot of options for that. And, and Lori and I have talked about some of the, the financial analyzation of these these things um you may want to strike it completely you, you may want to look at it and say okay we, we've already we've looked at other things we, we can take that out um i know that the intent was when it was put in there it was to cover big expenditures it was you know a two hundred thousand dollar fire truck it was never intended to to cover the the two-year internet subscription that extends beyond 12 years you, you don't want to have to do that um for the most part, what these departments do is in your normal budget process, they will put an area in there and say, okay, we're, we're doing this this year, or the line items in the budget will cover expenditures for certain things, and, and we approve it that way. Um, but we just need a little clarification on, on where you want to go with that and how you want to deal with that in the future. Um, you know, maybe you want that to apply to the purchases over thirty thousand dollars, over fifty thousand dollars. Maybe the form bid threshold of ninety thousand um, dollars. One of the things we looked at, and, and you've got a really good financial 
panelist over here, you've got a semi-adequate one here. But we are not, we, we discussed it, and, and we don't normally deal with the, the analyzation of financial transactions such as commercial lending, which is basically what this would be on a routine basis. Um, and I actually talked to, to one of the, the larger institutions to see what they look at when they lend to nonprofits. Uh, and they look at, you know, they're going to look at their cash flow coverage ratios. They're going to see if they've got enough cash coming in to cover the debt. Um, they're going to look at debt to asset ratios. They're going to look at, uh, you know, they're going to look at their net income statement to see what kind of money's there for them. Um, so it may be that if you get a request and these folks have went through a, a reputable lending institution for whatever dollar figure you're looking for, you know, there's not much more that we could probably do that these folks haven't already done, uh, particularly if it's a third party lender, because the third party lender is only making their money off the payments and the interest that they're getting. Now, if it's a, I guess, quote, second party lender, for instance, and I'll use them as an example, it's like Ford Motor Credit. Maybe you're buying a Ford vehicle through Ford Motor Credit. Okay, th those are kind of the same. They're different, but they're kind of the same. So Ford's making money off the sale. So you know, maybe they're more inclined to make a loan to you than a third party lender would be. So maybe you want that to, to extend to all lenders that are reputable. Maybe you want it to extend to the third parties only. Um, you know, maybe there's something else that, that you want us to look at. And, and you may not even look at any of it. Uh, but we but we want to make sure that, the particular since this is in our contract, and, and we've, we've danced around it for a while, but we really need to clarify what that is and what you all want to see so that, that we make it very clear to the folks that are submitting us information so they know what to get for us and that we know what to expect from them when they provide it for us. Um, one of the things that, that we actually thought about, and this goes back to one of the other recommendations in the study, uh, as far as audits. Uh, obviously, the two municipalities, they, they have audits done annually. Uh, but, and, and there is some, some public law in, or general statutes in North Carolina, 159.4, that, that nonprofits that receive more than $1,000 of public funds are required to submit an audit. However, when you read the fine print, when you get into the lawyer stuff at the bottom, there's a long list of, of folks that are excluded, and volunteer fire departments are excluded. Now, we can't require it. They can offer it to us. We work out a deal and they can give it to us, and that's the other lawyer thing. It just says we can't require it. Doesn't mean we can't get it. Um, you know, maybe we say that, you know, if you provide us an audit every year, every three years, every five years, what, whatever you want to come up with, and it's it's positive, it's good, uh, maybe that meets your concurrence. So if you give us a letter from the lending institution, then you're good. Um, maybe you're happy with the way we're doing it now. Um, but we just felt like the... There, there wasn't a really good definition in there on, on what that concurrence was. And we just want you to think about some things that, that might provide a little clarity, not just to us, but to your fire departments to make sure that, that they understand what we're looking for uh, and make sure that, that we help them any way we can so that they're financially able to do what they need to do. Uh, and again, th this is not, we're not bringing this to you and we made it very clear when we did a study this is not because we think we have any issues financially in any of them. Um, as of the moment, they are all doing very well financially. We, we, we've gotten better records in the last couple of years than we've had in a long time. Um, but we're on the uphill track with it and we're making some positive progress and we don't want that to fall behind somewhere. So, last good night, I just want to give you some stuff to think about. Um, depending on the changes that we make would probably require a contractual revision. So obviously that's not gonna happen overnight. So anything that we would discuss sometime in the next several months would require time for us to, to negotiate all that contractual obligation stuff out and get the contract ready to go or to make the definition in there of what we actually expect out of these things. So this is not something that, that we expect to happen overnight or tomorrow. This is something for the long term that we need to be thinking about now before we have an issue come up somewhere down the road and we're not really prepared. So that's good. That's all I'm doing tonight. Let's put that out there for discussion and I'm open to any questions. All right. Go ahead. One question. Does most of the fire departments uh, do annual audit? 
They do not. The, the only two that, that I know of that do an annual audit are the municipalities. Um, the others, depending on which department it is, they will do some type of financial review. Um, it can be very short, it can be more lengthy, it depends on the department. Um, so there's it's probably not consistent across the board what kind of animal penalization is going on. The uh, fire protection agreements do, uh, do provide for the county to inspect records we needed to do, need to do so. But that's never happened. And actually, yeah, I think it, yeah. I think there has been some it, it has, occasions where um, it has happened. We, we have actually inspected records. Um, the, you know, and there's no... But that was triggered by... So usually there's something that triggers the yeah. yes yeah i mean there's a routine yeah, on, on us just saying okay hey we're coming to see your financial records or whatever we, we don't no, there's a routine procedure that's correct you see those are all tax dollars that's correct we're accountable here we can ask for it anybody can ask us what we got in <coughs> uh, the uh, general fund uh, the fund balance uh, i mean and that's the thing we're dealing with $50 million here, but those fire departments, they're about, what, $2 million now? $2 million? Yeah, somewhere. About $3 million? About $3.4 million. $3.4 million tax dollars. That's all tax money. And there needs to be, I've always said, there needs to be some account, not that I don't trust people, but what is the reserve funds? And we've never been able, and that's what Chester's alluding to, we've never been able to determine what the reserve funds are. Do they have $10,000 in reserve fund or fund balance, or is it 100000 We don't know. Taxpayers have the right to know every detail about these fire departments. And uh, I think would make concurrence to me would be, let's just eliminate it. Why are we trying to control some aspect of a nonprofit without knowing the full financial condition of that nonprofit. So I'd say let a concurrence just drop that term completely. Yeah, and, and you know the budgets as far as the totals, the lawyer obviously knows the totals, the, the the departmental amounts per year range from around 150000 to about eight hundred thousand dollars And so you have you have some folks that have this amount of money and you have some folks that have this amount of money. So it kind of varies from from area to area as far as what the uh, what the amounts are that we're talking about and, you know, and there's another option that, that we've looked at as far as this study you, you talk about the public funds and obviously those public funds are were are distributed with the intent to purchase and acquire equipment and provide those services oh, right. um, you know if, if you wanted to eliminate that Part of concurrence and take that away, then, then you may want to look at the the clawbacks on the, the contract because North Carolina, correct me if I'm wrong, Chester, nonprofits they they can if they were to cease providing the service for some reason, they can distribute their assets. But those assets have to be distributed to another nonprofit. They can't just sell them to board members make a profit. They they have, there are certain statutes that guide how they distribute them. But they, there's nothing that says that they would have to distribute them to the next fire department that took their place, or to the neighboring fire department that was going to cover that service. So you, you could. We don't think it's going to happen, but you could have an asset that the citizens of the community paid for that essentially would be transferred to the coast somewhere in there. Your folks in that area would have to start over again with with the funding to get those assets back. So. You know, you might want to look at it another way and say, okay, we're we're good with eliminating the concurrence, but we want to know that what you buy, there's some provision that if you were to cease operating, it, it came back to a third party or something, so it can be distributed to the next person that took the service. Um, so you know, there's a lot of options we can look at. We just need to know how you want to go and which direction you want to go. Transparency is key. Federal, I mean. Taxpayer dollars should be completely transparent. There's no reason for any secrecy at any level. Whether it's a fire department, county, any, you know. And, and again, let me reiterate, for the, for the record, we don't think there's any financial no. problem with the one now. We're very pleased with what we have. Uh, we've come a long way in the last 20 some odd years that I've been here. Um, so we're very pleased and we just want to keep that going in a positive direction. And there, so and there, was, there was a fairly uh, 
there are fairly good contractual provisions for the provision of records and uh, indeed in connection with budget requests. And we also have to understand the records. So, you know, and it's been said many times up here, and I'll reiterate, they are one of the best bargains we have as far as the service they provide for us, particularly with our insurance ratings and you know, the stuff that they're providing now. So we need to make sure whatever we enter into is something that's mutually agreeable and can work with on both sides of this so that we can help them get what they need without the money burst from their health. Open and fair. Correct. I think, uh, based upon what you said, I agree uh, for the most part of what you said, uh, Paul. Uh, I, I think openness uh, is just a given. Yeah, it's, it just needs to happen. That's why I like uh, the concurrence of the Megan County Fire Marshal's Office. I think is important. Uh, why? Um, uh, I'm just going to throw out an example. Um, we'll pick on Kevin here. <laughs> They've got a, uh, a ladder truck in Franklin. So those are very expensive trucks, six hundred thousand plus. Plus, 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 <laughs> plus, plus. plus, plus. plus. Okay, let's just say that I don't know, Clark Chapel. They decide they want to buy one. There's really nothing that says that we can't say no, even though common sense, in my opinion, says, well, why do they need one? If Franklin has one, and they're a first mutual aid to Clark Chapel. You know, we want to see the taxpayer so I, I think it's good to, for the county just to at least have a little bit of knowledge and say, okay, well, let's at least look at <clears throat> before you make that expenditure of what we're going to do. Um, I don't know. If, if y'all don't mind, I'll research this with Warren and come back with a support or recommendation in our next meeting and go for that. So, okay. Is that okay with everybody? Due to my lack of knowledge, can you define concurrence to us in a simple way for me to understand it? <laughs> the the basically it was intended to say that we agree that the expenditure is legitimate and has a legitimate purpose. That that was what the intended definition was. And However, that, we there, as who we as in the Macon County Fire Marshal's office okay. and as such the Macon County Board of Commission okay. would concur with their decision. Would we agree that your expenditure is is what you need, and we agree that you can financially sustain it. However. Okay. That is the implied definition because that that's what I think it means. Actually, but that fire marshal, not the commissioners, it. is the way the, the document reads presently. If the commissioners want to be involved in that decision making, then that agreement will need to be revised. Or what's the uh, definition of a capital expenditure? Uh, for the county, a fixed asset or capital is five thousand dollars or more. Five thousand. All right, thank you, Warren. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Warren. Thank you. I'll get with you. Grab lunch. You can buy. <laughs> All right. Uh, 11B, uh, request by Mr. William F. Thomas for an exception to the Macon County Flood Ordinance. Uh, Planning, Permitting, and Development Director, Mr. Jack Miller. Mr. Yeah. Uh, we have a now, Mr. and Mrs. Thomas. Right there. They own property down off of Woodchuck Lane on 28 North. Pretty much, if you were standing at the old Oak Grove Baptist Church looking at the river, you'd be looking across their property below between 28 and the river. Back in July, we had to see the complaint that they had placed some field in the floodplain, which is against their ordinance. And Mr. Bill Allen, who's my assistant, and the real bit help, thank you very much, went down there and investigated, and indeed they had. Well, it's our job to uh, send them a notice of violation, which was sent on the 19th, advising them that they were in uh, violation of the ordinance and to remove the field. And Mr. and Mr. Thomas came in. Uh, they had no idea. But we had the flood ordinance. They had no idea that they should have had a permit or a uh, land storage permit. They had listened to the advice of their grading contractor, which was incorrect. And uh, they were a little bit frightened by the whole idea. So we asked him why they did this. 
And you should have in your pack there, uh, it looks like this, an old, old head that photographed the property. Yeah. In front of their house, toward the river is the driveway, and it's subject to severe flooding. And when it floods, there is no way out. Their attempt was, if you look right at the end of their uh, parking area, they took a little ramp up to Highway 28 and grabbed it for an emergency exit in case of flooding. They parked the car up there above the base flood elevation. Then when it flooded, they would get out. They said, that's our intent. We didn't intend to harm, <clears throat> intend to harm anybody. We didn't intend to break any laws, but here we have. So what do we do here? Well, we have a concession in our floodplain ordinance for exceptions to the requirements. And uh, those exceptions cannot be granted by me. They have to be granted by this board of commissioners. And that's the reason we're here tonight, is for you men to consider <coughs> the merit of what they've done to determine if it does comply with the exceptions, the, uh, the requirements to be granted the exception, and then the decisions up to you whether you want to grant it or not. So I can get anywhere else you want me to, or we can just get right into it. Chester, uh, just matter of formality. Um, because this is sort of a, a quasi-judicial hearing, is this something that we need to advertise further and put on a... No, I, I don't think like we just handle it now. I, I mean, I mean we're going to have to hear testimony from both Jack, uh, maybe Mr. Thomas. And I, I think there's any problem. presume we're going to need to swear them in. Um, so when, is, when do we open that case? Uh, do we do it now? Um, just need a little guidance. I think if the board is inclined to proceed with the hearing uh, this evening, then the board can certainly do that. I think it's a matter of a, there's an application for an exception uh, that I believe was filed by Mr. and Ms. Thomas. Is that correct? I think it would be appropriate for um, uh, Mr. Thomas to be Mr. or Mrs. Thomas, or perhaps even both of them, if they wanted to, uh, to be sworn and just uh, go through the application with this board, and uh, the board should hear their application. The application, as I understand it, uh, Jack, and you correct me if I'm wrong, it, set, it sets forth the matters which are required in, in order for the board to grant an exception. We need to hear under oath that uh, the application meets those uh, that the criteria for an exception before you could grant it. Basically, grant the variance. Uh, yeah, key things everybody gets treated the same here in this ordinance. You know, we had some, we had, we were going to have a hearing six or eight months ago on the thing out on Range of White Road, uh, the farmer. We resolved that with that flame loss, yeah. but it was appealed. I mean, it was that case handled the same way that we're handling this? He, he was appealing our decision, my decision, yeah. the enforcement of the flood ordinance, and we met with Mr. Moss out there, and he decided to take other action. He withdrew the appeal. He withdrew yes. the appeal. Oh, he did withdraw it. Yes. Uh, but he never filed for an exception. Is that what we're, is that the difference in the two? Yes. The exception is an exception to this in the bill. It generally, Mr. Jones, if I'm wrong, tell me. Uh, the bill is usually that they don't believe that my decision is correct. Administration. But they're given the option of appealing or things like that they want to do. I don't think Mr. Ms. Thomas uh, have a sense that I have misinterpreted the ordinance. That's just like an exception to it. And the ordinance specifies certain criteria which must be met in order for an exception to be considered. Predetermined criteria as part of the ordinance. Well, I don't have a problem here. I presume I don't know this. Move along. Y'all want to do it tonight? Y'all? Absolutely. Yes, sir. We'll hear it. <laughs> All right. 
Well, trust me if it's okay, I'm all, uh, under your guidance. I'm gonna I think it'd be appropriate this in. time to, uh, to probably first ask Mr. and or Mrs. Thomas to come and address their application to the board uh, under oath. Okay. Uh, we would respectfully request Mr. Morgan to listen to that testimony intently and uh, once uh, they have completed their presentation, I think it'd be appropriate for you to request that Morgan give uh, his interpretation of the testimony and whether it fits the criteria required by the ordinance. Okay. Well, Mr. Ms. Thomas, we don't, do, we don't handle these every day very often. <laughs> I understand. Uh, how many of these have you seen in your years of We've service? We've seen a few. Yeah, I think this is the Bible? second one I've seen. Need a Bible. Bible. Commissioner. All right, I'm going to swear each of you. I'll go to Ms. Thomas first. Do you swear to tell the truth, nothing but the truth? So help you God. Is that correct? I do. Okay. Mr. Thomas, do you swear to tell the truth, nothing but the truth? So help you God. Yes. Okay. Good. Well, welcome. We'll proceed. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll hear your side of the story and then we'll, we'll go forward. Well, as Mr. Morgan mentioned, we didn't realize we were creating a problem when we started this. And this began back in May after the last flood. Um, we uh, knew we had to come up with some other method for getting out of the property when it comes up because the current situation is all the water that runs down woodchuck runs right down into our front yard and, um, so if the water comes out of the river that all comes right into our front yard too but well, that's the only way out of the property so that's the very first thing that always floods so we were trying to come up with a way to allow us to have an access that would not be subject to flooding like that. We didn't think we were causing any problem. The uh, field dirt that we added was downstream from our house. Our house would flood before that would be affected. And we have no neighbors downstream. It's the North Carolina uh, Green Belt. Resource station. Yeah, where the swinging bridges and all that it's a green belt area there's nothing there the closest house is way down the river and it's quite a ways from the river so we didn't think we were causing any kind of a problem we didn't know we were we asked our contractor if we needed a permit and he said no so we went ahead with the construction of the driveway only to find out we did need something so that's kind of how we got here and uh, to us, it's a safety factor because uh, Mr. Uh, Beal's been out there, Mr. Morgan's been out there. They've seen the existing driveway. It's not really a very safe um, situation. So that was our thinking. I can go through my answers to the questions on the um, appeal. I think that would be appropriate. Okay. I just take it from one right on down through the entire process they need to hear each of those well the what i saw as far as the uh, uh, application the the portion that talked about uh, the appeal started with article four so that's where i started my uh, my uh, narrative here um, as far as article 4a which is the first there should be no danger to other persons or property from the construction of the driveway as I mentioned we have no residents downstream that should be affected by our construction and we are connected to the North Carolina public green belt land um, article 4b the only danger to life and property from this development would be to us if there were any uh, as i mentioned it's on the other side of our house so our house would flood first uh, article 4c the uh, proposed driveway would no in no way increase the possibility of flood damage to our property i mentioned if it's going to flood it's going to flood before it would ever affect that um, the direction of the river flow would impact our house and 
the garage without uh, <coughs> affecting anything else. No other properties would be in danger from the development. Uh, Article 4D, I just have this is not applicable. It doesn't, it talks about the member, but I don't have the good copy of the actual. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 4D. Oh, the importance of the services provided by the proposed facility to the community. There should be none. It's on our property and we would be the only <coughs> use it. Personal and, residence. Yeah. And it should not have any effect on public transportation or safety or anything like that. Um, for E. Okay. This, the necessity of the facility of a waterfront location is un, as defined under Article 2 of this ordinance as a functionally dependent facility where applicable. I don't see how that applies in this case. So I just put not um, The available availability of alternative locations not subject to flooding or erosion damage for the appropriate use. There is none. We're in the floodplain. Um, uh, let's see. There is no other location. The reason was to provide a safe access and egress from the property. In case of a flood, the only current access to the property is through the area that is the first to flood. is highly susceptible to flooding. Um, this new structure would be much slower to flood and less likely to flood and would allow us time to safely leave the property. In addition, uh, private vehicles could be parked on the driveway strategically so we could get out of there and quickly if needed. Um, the other property access is through the shared roadway, which is also shared by three other houses upstream from us. So we're not affecting them in any way. Uh, Article 4G, the compatibility of the proposed use with existing and anticipated development. Can't imagine you guys are going to do any development is on our private property. So I don't think that one would be applicable. The proposed, the safety, let's see if I'm getting myself right here. Relationship of the proposed use to the comprehensive plan and floodplain management program for that area. I don't see where it would be a, a detriment to your floodplain management there. As I mentioned, there's not really anything that would be impacted by the uh, current location. For the safety of access to the property in times of flood for ordinary and emergency vehicles. This would actually be improved or increased. Uh, Cowie Fire Department serves our area and they come and check on properties every time there's a chance of a flood and so forth. They would have a much easier time to get access to the property in the event of a flood if they needed to do a rescue. Um, than they would have with the current driveway. Um, let's see. 4J. The expected heights, velocity, duration, rate of rise, and sediment transport of the floodwaters and the effects of wave action of Africa expected at the site. I don't know anything about heights, velocity, duration, or anything like that, but I don't think it would be applicable because, again, I don't see where it would be affecting anything except us. Um, okay, 4K, cost of providing governmental services during and after flood conditions, including maintenance and repair. This, there would be no additional costs to Macon County or the government because of this development that I can see because it's completely on our property and it would be our responsibility to, to maintain it. Um, let's see. Four. 
okay, the cost of providing government services during and after flood conditions, including maintenance and repair of public. Right, again, I guess I did that one. All right. Um, Article 5, a written report addressing each of the above factors. I believe you should have a copy of what I just mentioned. Um, it says that you all may have attached whatever uh, conditions you deem appropriate to the um, granting of an exception if you should choose to do so, which we hope you will. Um, number seven, any applicant to whom an exception is allowed shall be given written notice specifying the difference between the base flood elevation and the elevation to which the structure is to be built. And that such construction below the base flood elevation increases risk to life and property. Uh, well, our house is already there, so the, the really uh, uh, difference there is is uh, not really applicable. I wouldn't say we already have flood insurance. We know that we have to have flood insurance, and I don't see that this would impact our flood insurance in any way. Um, Flood plain administrator shall maintain records. Uh, I'm sure Mr. Morgan will do that. And then conditions for exception is item nine. Nine uh, A exceptions shall not be issued when the modification will make the structure in violation of other federal, state, or local laws. I don't believe it would. Can't imagine that it would. Number nine B exceptions shall be not be allowed any designated floodway or non-encroachment area if the exception would increase would result in any increase in flood levels during the base flood discharge again i don't see that that would because it's beyond our house it would, it would affect us before it would affect that and there's no one downstream that would be affected let's see c Exceptions shall only be issued upon a determination that the modification is the minimum necessary considering the flood hazard to afford relief. <coughs> Pretty much is, I think. I don't know of any other solution that would, would allow us um, access or egress from the property that would not involve something similar to this. Exceptions will only be issued prior to development permit approval. Uh, we kind of blew that one, but uh, we did not know. The nine E exceptions shall only be issued upon showing of good and sufficient cause. I hope you feel that we are showing good and sufficient cause. Um, Determination that failure to grant the exception would result in an unusual hardship to the owner of the property that was not caused in whole or in major part by the property owner. Well, I guess we caused the problem, but we're trying to solve the problem at the same time. And then a determination that the granting of the exception will not result in increased flood heights, additional threats to public safety, extraordinary public expense, create nuisance, cause fraud, or on victim victimization of the public or conflict with existing laws or ordinances. Uh, aside from what we're already talking about, I don't see any uh, impacts from any of that. Um, and I believe that's pretty much the end of it. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Any questions from the board? So <laughs> this is an appeal hearing. Yeah. No, it's not no, the deal. It's no, no, no. Yes. Yeah, kind of for an exception. Yes, we've already appealed. You've appealed to Mr. Morgan. Again, what he was asking for with the conventional request for an appeal was not an appeal from the decision administrator, but relief from the ordinance by way of an exception. I can't do the exception. Yeah, I'm, I'm not opposed to what you got. I'm, I think I'll be able to tell you. Frankly, the purpose of a floodplain ordinance is even though you've described you're not damaging anything, mm -hmm. 
The only concerns about filling a floodplain and have a biology background is that when you place dirt in it, it displaces that future flood water and forces it onto someone else. That's the concern. In other words, if you go and fill a hundred acre flood land six foot deep, you've displaced future flood water, forcing it on someone else. You've narrowed the channel for drainage. But I'm not opposed to your thing, but I just want to make sure that we're being fair. I've been on your on this board six years and this is the second issue of this. And if you disagree with the decisions that you've been given, I think for us to be uh, to hear it as an appeal, as an appeal, I mean, we've duly sworn these people. But do we square them for exceptions? I, I'm not sure that I understand. <coughs> I mean, your question. Or I know the other floodplain thing with Mr. Moss we had. We were prepared to do a hearing. Correct. And that was the appeal as described in the ordinance. But this is an exception that we're treating it as. Or we would have to hear the evidence to determine whether or not the criteria specified by the ordinance has been met by the applicant for the exception. And from that standpoint, I think when Mr. and Ms. Thomas have rested, I think it would be appropriate to to the board to ask Jack Morgan to testify and to give his understanding of what the exception requires and to give his understanding of whether or not that criteria has been met by Mr. Ms. Thomas. Uh, Mr. Thomas. Any other questions? Mr. Thomas for I'll call Jack up. <clears throat> is, is the, just what I'm looking at here, yes, sir. Is, is this a long-term or short-term solution? Yeah, this is going to be a long-term solution. And it's a long-term, it's an emergency exit, what it is. Right. But are the banks and things that I'm looking at, well, we stopped before the driveway was completed because okay. Mr. Allen came out and informed us that we had to stop. So we did. So it's not completed Okay. at this point. What will completion look like? Well, we will plant grass okay, on the uh, banks. On the banks to prevent erosion. There needs to be some more gravel put on the driveway to hydrate that and things of that nature. It's, it was work in progress at the time it was stopped. Go back to Mr. Higdon's question or concern. What happened to what happens to the displaced water when, when it comes down? When you have a flood, you're protecting yourself. But where did that water? Where does it go? Well, we're not actually protecting our own house. We're just providing a way off the property. Our house, it, uh, the river flows this way. Our house would sit here, and the driveway would sit here. So the water, if it if it was blocked by the driveway, would back up into our house right. and nothing else. And this is the flood plain there. This is not the flood way. Is there anyone plain. else that can use this? Or are you the only one? We would be the only ones that would use it. it is. What size property yeah, do you have there? It's an acre and a third. Okay. Did, did you build your house? No. We launched about a little over two years ago. In 16. June of 16. Did it occur to you that you might be in an area that would be prone to flooding? Yes, we knew that, but we didn't realize that it would be you know, as bad as it is in terms of, it's really the roadway that causes the problem. Because if the river rises and the water has nowhere to go from the roadway. So the, it floods our front yard, even if the river doesn't necessarily come out of its banks. All it has to do is get up high enough that the water from the road has nowhere to go. And There's literally a ditch. There's literally a ditch on the, I guess it's 40 foot from the house, yes. 50 foot from the house. 
that comes down to the river and the river don't even have to get to the banks before that water backs up. It's just like if you got a water surge, it backs up into the ditch and it closes their driveway off even if the water ain't even up to the bank. That's correct. And, yes. and that's not on your property. No, it's not. So that's, that's, not. The, that's there, the real there problem. There's a picture here. that I had enclosed in the, in the application, I, I assume you have it, that shows a picture of the flooding from May. And that picture was taken, the water was not above the, the bank. It was right up to it, but it was not over the bank. But the driveway in the front yard had about that much water. And that's what makes this situation so unique. When I went down there, we had we made we done some measurements to see about the floodplain and where it was at, and tried to figure out, mm -hmm. you know, something because. And what was so unique? The, the water don't even have to be the top of the bank, and they they're shaded. And and what you know, what I, my biggest point was for the, for emergency exit, not only for them but for emergency personnel mm -hmm. to get to that river. Because that would be the only way for them to get, to maybe even to get boats in the river to go down. We've talked to some of those other folks, and, mm -hmm. and so it can it can enhance in several ways. And and I don't really think it, it because if that water got up to where you put the driveway, and your house is already flooded. That's exactly right. Yeah. I think we don't think so. This is this is not this is not to be the primary. Well, it will be. It will become primarily our primary. What the dumps? Ingress and ingress because. But the other two houses that's above you would continue to use the existing road. Right? Yes, they have. They have another exit down on the other end. Okay. And they, they, we're not affecting the. the uh, so when the road floods, then they can turn and go. The they can go the other way. You don't have that. We do not have that option. Thank you. All right, Jack, are you ready? Thank you. 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 Jack, I swear you in. Okay. You swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so I hope you got it. Yeah, I did. Thank you, Jack. Proceed. I know we got several questions for you. So. Okay. Uh, you start with questions or? Uh, go, go ahead and proceed with your. Okay. Uh, Unless you'd like us to ask questions first and find out too. That's your priority there. I have a, a rough drawing of approximately what this, this looks like. Uh, I'd like to pass out and get kind of flavor of how much we're talking about. Extra. The, uh, excuse my drawing skills, I forgot how to do drafting. But if you look at the, the, the natural grade that it was before they did anything, is the bottom line there. And then the driveway slope is what they've added in. The, uh, <clears throat> the floodway doesn't exist there. There's a non-encroachment area. And it's, it stops right about the toe of that. So none of this is in the non-encroachment area. The gentleman will not be allowed in the uh, line exception in that area anyway. So you don't have to worry about that. But it's approximately 92 feet up to Highway 28. And about 20 foot from the toe is three foot high. And on up at uh, 40 feet, it's about five and a half foot high. And I don't know, let me see. That'd be 60 feet? It'll be 92 up the top. The measurements would be 40 feet from the toe. It'd be 60 feet from the toe. 60 foot from the toe, so it's higher up next to 28. Yeah, it is. Let me see yours. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. And that dash line on there is the. Uh, approximately the base flood elevation. So all this field we put in is not in the floodplain, just what is below that line would be what is in there. Now, uh, to, in consideration of what evidence they provided, they were requested by the ordinance to provide those uh, answers to those acceptance may be issued 
And uh, section E4 where it says, passing common exceptions, the field board shall consider all technical evaluations, all relevant factors and standards specified, and do it be A through K that uh, Mr. Thomas presented. And uh, I don't know how you gentlemen felt about the response to that, but I think that they met the criteria to bring it to you gentlemen to be considered. Now, uh, we have met other people in the past that have asked for exception, and I say, all right, fulfill this first obligation, well, they can't answer these questions that you gentlemen could support, that I could support, but I feel like the Thompsons have done that. Their, uh, their situation is unique. It's, uh, of course, they bought the property not in the flood, and they just right beside the river. It's a beautiful little piece of property, but the safety of the Thomases getting out of there is more of a concern to me than the amount of field there they placed in there in this case. They've, uh, let's see, Mr. Trigger, you've got a pretty quick brain on these figures. We've got approximately 60 foot. Well, let's figure half of that. So it's about seven foot high up the, the top to nothing, seven foot high, 92 feet, and it's uh, nine foot wide gravel, 20 foot to tow. About 1,500 cubic feet of dirt in the floodplain, approximately cubic yards is what I figured. So it's not a substantial amount, but it's not a wheelbarrow though, either. It's, it's some. But uh, the conditions for the exception, I'm um, down at number nine of that section. Exceptions shall not be issued with modification if when the modification will make the structure in violation of other federal, state, or local laws, regulations, or ordinance. It is not that I'm aware of. There's no federal laws that affect his property other than the floodplain ordinance, which we're considering an exception of now. No state laws, no local laws, no other regulations other than the floodplain ordinance that I'm aware of. Don't be aware of anything else. Uh, B, exceptions will not be allowed within the designated floodway, which is a non approaching there, which it's not. C, exceptions shall only be issued upon the determination that the modification is amendment necessary considering the flood hazard to afford relief for the Thompson's, of course, since that's the only people it affects. I don't know of any, any other option actually they have to try to to get out of their safety because there is a photograph Mr. Thomas provided to help you have it. No, that's Give me just a second to get out of there. Is that where the water that's came back up? It's back toward the back. This one, this was in May. You don't remember a flood in May? Okay. I didn't get that. Uh, yeah, that was in the agenda package. It's in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. I didn't get it. Or the first picture. Oh, I'm going to the CDL. Uh, yeah, they came as separate so, attachments. Separate attachments. Oh, separate attachments. Okay, I just went to the PDF file. Yeah, you had a. There were three uh, attachments on it. Yeah, you don't have to look at the application is there. I don't even know if that's a bunch of water and a fence and a couple of trees. Well, what that is is that's his driveway gate. With May flood and uh, you see that in the background the river's pretty close to the top of the banks, but it's not out. But it's already cut their exit off. Already. So this is what they're trying to avoid. They wake up in the morning and you're trapped and they can't get the car out and you run up wood chunk lane and just gets deeper for a little ways to get the next house. So I think this is they have attempted. The minimum they could really. Uh, D exceptions shall only be issued prior to development permit approval. Would not approve the permit because they didn't submit one before they did the work. So that's a few gentlemen to consider that. We've not issued a permit for this. Read that again. It says exceptions shall only be issued prior to the development permit approval. We cannot approve this permit application without approval. 
you answer that. Don't let me incorrect. <laughs> okay. Paragraph E, section shall only be issued upon showing good and sufficient cause. As Mr. Thomas argued, determination that failure to grant the exception would result in unusual hardship. That's up for you to determine by Mr. Thomas's argument. Number three, determination that by granting the exception will not increase and uh, result in increased flood heights, additional threats to public safety, extraordinary public expense, great nuisance, cause fraud or victimization of public or conflict in existing laws or ordinances. And again, that's up for you, gentlemen, to consider Mr. Thomas's argument. Over the years, we've heard different versions of this, Jack, as you well know. And this is not one for monetary gain. This is not one that we've heard him for Taylor Park. We've heard him for a lot of different things. This is strictly for the safety of the, of the, of the citizens of our community. And if you saw the, and we went down, maybe went down more than once, and, and uh, trying to figure out some type of solution because it is a safety issue. And when you see the flood, the driveway flooded and the river not even out of the banks. That's what is, is the real problem here. And, and it is a safety issue, but it's also a safety issue for the emergency vehicles if they should have to get down in there for whatever reason. And so uh, uh, if, if, if Mr. Morgan's in agreement, I would certainly support the, uh, the, the argument that, that this should be granted as a variance and an exception to the floodplain. It, it, it really, there's not enough dirt there to really matter to a whole lot. I mean, 50 cubic yards when you're comparing, uh, when, you, when you're filling something, is, especially in this location, uh, I just don't see where it would, it, if you want to harm anybody, it's going to harm them. So, um, so. I'm sorry. Huh? I didn't mean to Oh, that's fine. Go ahead. I uh, have another drawing here for what I would recommend as the uh, ordinance allows and conditions to be placed on the exception. What report the initial contract told me they need to do this? They need, a, they need a permit. Uh, that's a separate subject right there. Pardon? That's a separate subject to this, but yes, there is a problem there. That's a great lesson. <laughs> but I apologize. I was not prepared for an appeal hearing tonight or an exception. We had one, like I say, in six years that I've been on here. So I'm not being, I'm for letting you use your driveway and getting in and out of there. I'm, I'd like to see this floodplain ordinance and all that. But we have to make sure that everybody that comes is treated equally. Yeah. What, what I would recommend is uh, if those little three circles, put a little three circles in mine, we'll put some culverts in under that to allow the water to balance on either side of that embankment. What size is it? Uh, nothing less than 18 inches. I recommend probably, as you get, if you look, probably 18 inches is the best you can do right there, but the three foot mark, you might get on up to 36 on, it, on up there. That, that would help with some of the displacement for soil as well. That help with flow, but not necessarily displacement. Uh, uh, well, culverts hollow. Whatever the volume of the culvert you take out. Culvert is the only amount that you're deducting. Yes. This is what we've done across the road at Upper Walnut Creek. Yeah. Same, pro same, same principle. Big, but a big track of land. Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, any questions? So this would just be a modification that you're recommending yeah. that, that they follow? And the conditions to allow the exception. If you don't allow the exception, he has to take all that out. That's what the ordinance says. But it's, he's in agreement with the modifications. It really don't matter. I discussed that with Mr. Tongo. That's what the office said, the uh, conditions. Those culverts are not, the, the volume of that culvert, you're talking about what, 20 foot culvert? Yeah, it had to be 20 foot long. Yeah. Yeah, if, it was, if, 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 if this thing was, re, was stopping flow of water downstream, the culvert's a great idea. But it sounds to me like it's just more or less you're concerned about the displacement. It, it is yes, in hydraulic pressure on this field here. The 
uh, so once it's this, this is static water pretty much. Yeah. Once it's established over the ground cover, it's not going to be much pressure on the down slope pressure. No. I mean, I, I didn't even know about this until I got the agenda packet. I'd like to that or look at it. I'm not saying don't use, use that thing, but, but to sit here tonight and not being fully prepared, I've not reviewed the floodplain ordinance. I, I feel inadequate tonight, and I apologize. I don't like that thing. Uh, kind of real group, though. Uh, if y'all want to make a decision on if that's fine with me, but I'd like to. How many have seen, who on the board has seen the actual property? I have. There's liaison to the department. Uh, Joe, so you can ask Joe questions if you want to. Let me see what I've seen. They're the people in charge of it. Uh, they're recommending the variance with these recommendations. So, this, this is a thing to me, and this is just Jack speaking, the administrator. This flood warrants is for the protection of people more than it is property, I feel. And if this is not a way to help protect someone, to help them get out of there, if they got to get out of there, I don't know what else we could do. This usually Cowie's got a boat they used to have to get out these people. If the Thompsons have their car up here above the base flood elevation, they've got to wait and get water for a few feet and they're out. Otherwise they gotta go through the deep part. Because right there if rule twenty eight drops off, it just drops off like falling off this uh boat. Off, there's no access. So. I don't see the value value codes. Uh, I mean, that may have to flow some, but it's not going, you're not going to gain that much displaced equivalency in volume of those culverts. Uh, and all three culverts are below the floodplain level, right? Yeah, we've been in one of them. Yeah. Uh, I don't see any value in installing those culverts unless they were massive, and that would be. Astronomically expensive. But would the culverts allow the the bankment that I'm looking at more durable or safe or uh, yeah. the water going through it would take some pressure off the banking? Weaken it by digging a ditch all the way across that thing and trying to pack it back. You know, if, it, if it's compacting good, I don't know the construction standards on the, on the driveway. But, yeah, it, it wasn't complete, completed like you said, and it wasn't fully Was it built to some sort of road construction standards? Mm, it's, no, it's cracked already. What, what was your just, what was it just, It's cracked. The field dirt wasn't fully compacted, and it's cracked, so it's got to be compacted some of this. What he's got. This hope is there from Tuesday. It, it's not compacted in the I mean, if y'all want to rule on what's rule, but I mean, I like to run down and look at it. I mean, I'm not opposed to y'all. You got it in there. You can use it. You're using that, right? You haven't been ordered off of it or anything. Okay. I can't do that. <laughs> Jack, one question. I'm not second guessing your design, but um, I understand what the thought, what the thoughts are with the pipe. Do you, should there be any riprap or some sort of stone on the toe of that to provide any protection to, uh, to that? Do you have any concerns? No, I wouldn't. It, it, the purpose of the culvert is not primarily for stormwater flow where you would need to slow it down, which is what the riprap would do. And, and they get a good stable vegetation on the bank. That's a good protection. Right. The only thing I would add, Mr. Chairman, as with some other members on this board being involved in the planning board, we work very hard when we're working on these ordinances to do what needs to be done without encroaching on the right to do what they want to do with the property. And and this obviously there's some things set forth in it. So that that when the exception needs to take place, there's there's some criteria that has to be met. So to me, while I 
people involved in the ordinance, you know, it obviously someone, some group worked on it and they were able to develop a, a ordinance that serves the purpose to protect the citizens and it provides the avenue to be able to work around when you need to work around for the right reasons. So, you know, it seems like the process that's been put in place is working and, and it's, you know, it's just proof that, that it all right, here's what I'm uh, struggling with with this is uh, the fact that we're, my opinion, my opinion is that we're somewhat setting a precedence uh, for future dealings in Macon County. So uh, next week or next month, we're going to have another one. Someone says, well, we just gave them, they, they did it, didn't ask permission, they didn't get a permit. They put it in, so I want to do that now. Y'all did it for them. You're going to do it for me too. Now I understand their reasonings behind it, but at the same time, um, but in the same time, it's come to a pretty strict so. criteria they'd have to meet to do this. I agree. I mean, it's not the first rodeo we went to. That's why I'm struggling with it. So, no, that's a that's a great point, but, but that same criteria had to be met before this. Right. We, we have That's right. we, we said to it it'd be, it'd be sort of a no-brainer if it to come in <laughs> under the appropriate channels without it being completed prior. So, so that, Ms. Chown, is leads on to the department. I would, uh, under the, the evidence presented and under the direction of the uh, of the department head of Mr. Morgan and his recommendation, I make a motion that we grant the variance under the flood plan ordinance and uh, under the with the with the improvements as shown by Mr. Morgan, because that's his uh, that's his job and, and Mr. Allen's job, and I put that in the form of a motion and grant the Thomases the, the ordinance for for his safety purposes to All give right, them emergency. Motion on the floor. Did it say to include your motion? Include those. That's right. Um, a second. A motion and a second. Any further discussion? Uh, you're requiring the culverts as part of your motion. That's what. That's what the department had recommended. So I'm not going to go against his recommendation. Because that's their job. Y'all good with cold. And like he said, the road probably needs to compact in any way. And make them compact. But it really goes back to another ordinance that we're going to have to deal with in December. No. License, uh, ordinance. And any further questions? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, aye. Opposed, aye, aye. Red six. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Does anybody need a break before we continue? Yeah. Tammy's, Tammy's like, let's go. Let's <laughs> go. <laughs> <laughs> County Public Health Building. We do her that way every time. Schedules. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, Welcome, Jim. Thank you very much. <laughs> I lost mine too, Gary. <laughs> so I've got um, two items on the agenda this evening, and I'm going to do them voted on separately. Um, the first one I'll talk about is some changes to our billing guide, and I think you guys might have been sent the entire billing guide, so I'm going to draw your attention to page 9, which is the only page that has changes on it. All right. Um, Got it. Uh, hold on a second. Coming to it. Uh, public health, billing, and collection. What's that? The um, top of the page is women, infants, and children's nutrition. Nutrition program. Okay. All right. So you're you're wiping out the amazing 
the average is Wait, yes, yes. We're taking out um, the what's in red there being a resident of Macon County, and that's because WIC is a federal program and we cannot put those parameters on it. You can go to any county in North Carolina and apply for WIC. Um, so we have to take that out uh, for the requirement to be a resident of Macon County. Then um, if you'll look down the next two, the children's dental program and the adult dental program, it's the exact same change um, that we um, have had in the billing guide that you had to be a resident of Macon County to receive services from those two programs. We are adding um, an exception to that um, that you um, can also be served by participating uh, managed care organizations, so that's your insurance companies. If we are enrolled as a provider in an insurance company and MCO, we have to um, see any referrals or patients that are sent to us. Um, we will continue to make residents of Macon County a priority and give preference to those patients. But if we have a resident um, of a surrounding county or even Georgia that has um, insurance and we're an enrolled provider, um, we will have to um, be able to see that work that person into the schedule. So those are the changes with those. So I ask that you accept those changes. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to ask. Tenia, I'm okay. sorry, I can't report. I had to leave the last health board meeting early, but um, did the health board approve this? They did. Okay. Good. Can we get a motion to approve that? Oh, no changes. We got a motion. We got a second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Is that all? <laughs> okay. The second thing I have is some changes to our fee schedule. Okay, so um, the first um, four fees on there are brand new um, services and fees. These are lab services that we're getting orders from um, outside physicians for um, folks to come there to get uh, lab service. So these, um, that's the reason that we're adding um, these services uh, and the fees associated with those. The next uh, four are um, flu vaccine, um, and those are based on the change in the what our cost of the vaccine is. So we'll be going up on our flu vaccine this year um, based on the cost. And then the last one, um, the $79 one, is also a new fee, and that is a minor surgical procedure. It's um, like removal of warts or moles, those kind of things that um, we're having a need for in the clinic and are asking to add that. We get a motion to approve the fee changes. Okay. We motion to approve and a second. Mr. Shields, all in favor? Aye. Uh, 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 I like to just pronounce the word. <laughs> There's some doozies in there. Don't ask, don't ask me to do that. Thank you. <laughs> no spelling test. <laughs> Tammy. <laughs> all right. Jim, um, uh, we know that we received your uh, uh, notice of retirement. So this, I guess, might be your last official meeting in front of us, but uh, would you be willing to come back if we recognize you at our uh, at our October meeting? Or would you like to us publicly stand up and embarrass you now? <laughs> no, you can embarrass me now. Either way. Okay. I'd like for you to come back. I want to be a little bit more prepared for it. And if that's okay. Yeah, for your, your time with us. What date is that October meeting? Does anybody have that right there? Andy? The 9th. October 9th. Yeah. Is that good with you, Jim? Right. Mr. Manager, if you make sure that's on there. Sure will. All right, Jim. Thank you. All right. Thank y'all. Thanks for hanging out with us. Okay. All right. Um, item, item 11E, uh, discussion and consideration of a resolution of support for Oh, sorry, I missed one. It's 11D. Just kidding, Sheriff. <laughs> Discussion of grant award of 
for purchase of in-car cameras and body cameras for the Macon County Sheriff's Department. I smell like cheeseburgers and grilled sandwiches. Hey, you've been serving tonight. I've been That's at right. Motor Grill working. I ran back over here to <laughs> take a break to be able to come speak to you. I won't be long. Um, don't know if anybody will have any questions. I kind of hope not because I'm not asking for anything. I got some good news. Um, as all of you know, um, over the last several years, we've been talking about in-car cameras and trying to find the funds to be able to put in-car cameras into our vehicles because of the fact that the old cameras are dilapidated and, and no good. The company's been bought over four different times. And so basically we have no in-car cameras, um, maybe a couple of them. And so uh, about a year ago, I reached out to uh, Kevin Corbin and asked him for some help. Told him we were in the process of uh, going after some grant funds and uh, he uh, uh, agreed to look at some ways to find some money and and so I'm here tonight to tell you that uh, you all should have received I think uh, the notification uh, that we've been awarded 65,000 which sounds like a whole lot um, to me that's a whole lot of money but when it comes to buying these cameras it's really not a whole lot of money um, but uh, there's some avenues of uh, grants that we're reaching out. It was supposed to be due in September. They've moved it, so now it's in October. Um, so we'll be applying for those as well. Uh, we've been working really closely over the last couple of years with our um, IT department here in Macon County. And um, uh, if, if it would have been my way, uh, we would have probably messed up, to be honest with you. And the reason for that is because uh, there's, there's grants out there to where you can actually get such as body cameras, but you have to contract with them, uh, their, their system where you've downloaded this into. And then once you go out of being in a contract with them, then they have your evidence. And um, in talking with the, the IT guys, uh, it's not a good idea for our evidence to be somewhere else that we don't have control over because that's our evidence. And if we stop uh, being involved in a contract with a company, well, they still have our evidence. Um, and, and we can't get it. And so uh, uh, we've looked at several different models. Um, back when we first started talking about this, body cameras wasn't a big item of discussion. Um, it was mainly the in-car cameras that we were trying to get because you see so much more uh, with the vehicles having in-car cameras. You see when the blue lights come on, you see when the brake lights, it's, it reads all that information in the camera system uh, when it's recording. And uh, so, um, I would like for each of you, if you get an opportunity, to see Kevin Corbin, thank him. Uh, him and uh, uh, Speaker of the House Tim Moore made possible us to get this money. I'm excited about getting it. And um, sometime in the future, we'll be coming back to you um, once we've finalized exactly how we're going to utilize those funds. But one thing that's guaranteed is it has to be used for either in-car cameras or body cameras, and that is our full intention. What was the amount? 65,000. Do we need a motion, Chester, on this? Or There's just a motion amendment that needs okay. to be approved yeah. okay. for 65,000 to appropriate okay. the North Carolina grant and aid. And then it's included in the. Yeah, it's included in the committee. Yeah. We also know there's some 50-50 uh, grants. Um, that Do you accept the grant? Do what? I guess you did. We haven't, we haven't made taken a motion on it yet. That's Sorry. It. Oh, well. I'll up. No. Can we get a motion to approve it? So I'll move, Mr. Chairman. We got a second. second. We got a motion and a second by Commissioner Shields. All in favor? Aye. Uh, <laughs> so was that to accept the grant and approve the budget? That's, That's right. right. Okay. Yeah. I will tell you that we're uh, we've tried out a couple of different systems. Uh, we've got uh, about four officers right now that are utilizing them just for a temporary for a couple of weeks, um, and, and we're working with the company just to be able to see how they how they work. And um, uh, my officers. We're very excited about the possibility. Uh, I haven't, haven't spoken with one of my officers that are against body cameras. Of course, they've all want in-car cameras. Um, so we'll be we'll be coming back at a later date. We're just going to try to find some more money to be able to take care of that. Thank you, as, as you all asked me to do. Thank you, Sheriff. Back to cooking. I'm going back to serving food. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Sheriff. You. Thank, Thank you, Sheriff. All right. Item 11E. Uh, Discussion consideration of a resolution of support for Senate Bill 711, the North Carolina Farm Act of 2018. Commissioner Gillespie. Chairman, I think uh, all of you have 
uh, Senate Bill 711 and the resolution. Uh, I asked Chester to check the resolution to make sure that, that he didn't see any issues with it. And to check the version of 711 that I sent to you, make sure it was the appropriate one and who have done that. Um, there's, there's some, as always, there's some real challenges with our foreign community uh, right now, and this this is this is one that's on the forefront. Um, and it's these nuisance lawsuits that we've seen, and and this basically uh, is just just supporting uh, the Senate Bill 711 that has been passed. Um, Started with our with our producers, um, and it's real easy for us to sit here in the mountain and say that's a problem down east. But let me assure you, it's not because there's there's chickens in North Carolina, there's cattle standing on my place, um, and, and it affects all of us. So I just ask you to consider this. Um, the, the pork itself is 46,000 jobs, roughly $11 million a year to our economy. So it's, it's, I'm not going to read through all this. If anybody's got any specific questions, I'd be more happy to answer those. I will, as a side note, um, the second farm, the second lawsuit, um, the found the, uh, the rule in, in, in not in the farm's favor. Uh, that particular farm this week, they shipped the hogs off of that farm, and there was not hogs being replaced with that farm. So, um, you know, this thing can have a snowball effect, and people's is a big business. Well, they are. They're settled for what, $490 million? The yeah. first two were for four or five million. The third case it was heard, yeah. four hundred ninety million. Yeah, and there's twenty cases pending. Look, luckily there's some statutes in place that prohibit awards. It doesn't prohibit them. They're here for granted. But it prohibits. That will be challenged though. Uh, but you know, and, and this is my opinion. Nobody else's opinion. But my opinion is at some point, Smithville Farms. Just going to look at North Carolina and say it's not worth it. You know, the, the exposure that we have is not worth it in North Carolina and, 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 elsewhere. and, and I'm not implying that anyone just said that or anything, but common sense to me that you know, something like that's going to happen. So, with that in mind, I would make a motion that we. Second. Good motion to second. Any further discussion? Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll just add this right. to the agriculture commissioner, Jim Franklin. And of course, Carl was there, and we had a good meeting with him. And, and this was a big discussion down in Hickory, North Carolina. <coughs> Believe me, and, and if they can do it to the... And the thing about it, if you don't know this, and I don't know if I know this or if, if Gary knows, what they done, this was a group of lawyers from out in Texas. Yeah. They just and they come and they just chose and and these people moved in on this all for a while and they're nuisance suits and the same judges here at all three cases. The next one. The next one is different. Uh -huh. And yeah. and uh, we had a little conference call on that this week. So hopefully and and we're not the only county, but thank you, Carl, for his leadership on this and his. Uh, but it's right. It could be. It could be uh, something else besides that. Well, I'm glad we're sitting by saying hi. Hi. One additional side note to that. November 1st, Monday uh, and Bureau will have their annual meeting with the uh, Christmas barn. Uh, they, uh, the, a lot of folks that have been in the trenches, if you will, in regards to this, will be at that meeting. The executive director of Port Council will be there. Executive director of Port County Cattle Association will be there. Uh, the lieutenant governor will be there. So, if you have time on your schedule, uh, we might encourage you to come. Get some 
Thank you. All right, uh, consent agenda. We get a motion to approve unless there's something that someone would like to remove for discussion. Most of it was increases this time. <laughs> Any motion to approve the consent agenda? Maybe? Somebody? For discussion? I think it should be approved. No motion to approve. We get a second. We got a second. All in favor? Aye. All right. Uh, I don't think we have any appointments. Uh, we, we have had a request for a closed session uh, uh, acquisition regarding acquisition of property. And then we will be coming out. We're not expecting any action, correct? No, for now. All right, we're going to come out and we're going to uh, recess until uh, my anniversary, <laughs> September 25th. Actually, you're excellent. We're all out. 6 30 p.m. Yeah, who's those resolutions at, Ron? This will be at Old Edwards in Spring House on Spring Street in Highlands, North Carolina. You want it? And that's 6 30 p.m. September 25th. Old Edwards in Spring House, Spring Street, Highlands, North Carolina. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Address, I think mine has. Let's see, I'm feeling it. It is. I've got a little bit. 461 Spring Street. 461 Spring Street. Ah, no, sir. This is in All right, we got a motion to go into closed session. Mike. I understand all the Second. Same thing I feel about. If I go down to the east. Got a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I know it. Hello, shotgun. You got a fair kind of bad blood playing thing here, didn't it?